practicing ethics and problem solving. Um, uh, we're gonna break this uh, session down. We're gonna introduce ourselves in just one minute. We're gonna break this session down into a couple of different kind of compartments and we'll leave some time at the end to talk um, to, to for questions and things like that. Uh, we are gonna use the mics and if you have something to say, I'll, I'm gonna run around and give you mics as well um, because the lovely HowlRound is live streaming this. So um, we'll make sure and be, and be good about the microphones. Um, so, um, uh, also just a little tiny piece of business. I'm going to, um, we really wanna capture everyone's contact information, uh, both TCG and the lab and, and, and GTI are trying to create a sort of networking system of people who are working in the international arts sector. And, um, and instead of, I, I had this plan of doing like a really like elaborate like database in my computer and you would all sign in and then I didn't do that. So welcome to 1995 and here are some pieces of paper that you can fill out and like stick on this chair and I'll enter it all tonight. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks for doing that. Um, so um, just so you know also this is, this session goes until, pardon? Oh yes, I'm so sorry. Also, there's an evaluation form on the app, uh, uh, kind of like rate this session, and if you wouldn't mind when this session is over, going on there and rating that and other sessions that you go to, that would be super. Thanks for doing that. There's a clipboard icon next to it. Clipboard icon next to whatever session you are at. Yes, great, thanks Jordan. Um, uh, also, just so you know, this session goes until 12.15. We're gonna try to stop around noon for questions and then there'll be a short break, but we're actually gonna sort of continue the conversation. So if you do wanna stay with us through the lunch session, we'll continue to talk about things, but we'll wanna make sure that we invite people in that wanna come in and those of you that wanna go. Also, Teddy Roger from um, the lab is gonna be joining us, so, um, so feel free to stick around. Just hang out with us for a couple of hours and talk about international work, that'll be great. Um, okay, so we'd also like to begin today by recognizing the indigenous people in place where we stand, um, the Seminole and um, Miccosukee people, as well as all of the indigenous people who have stewarded and traveled this land. Uh, so let's start with introductions, um, so that you know a little bit about who we are. We'll be really fast. I'm Julie Hendren. I'm the executive director of Trick Lock Company. We are a 26-year-old uh, physical devised theater ensemble based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We do a lot of international work, international collaborations. We also tour quite a bit, um, but we also run the Global Corridor Program, and the flagship event of that is the Revolutions International Theater Festival, which is a three-week uh, cultural festival that happens in March. We bring companies from all over the world for um, performances and gatherings and workshops and things like that, and 2020 is going to be our 20th festival. So, yeah, that's who I am, Woohoo! Good morning, my name is Joanne Celia Lamparter. I prefer she, her, and hers, and I'm the Director of Education and Community Programs at Imagination Stage. Imagination Stage is a theater for young audiences outside of Washington, D.C., and we are newer to international work, but it has really been um, a formative part of some of the experience that our youth have experienced with us, and I'm excited to share a little bit about some of the cultural exchanges we've had with youth, and some of our international work has been a large part of our professional theater. Hello. Is it on? Um, hi, this is Toranji Gazarian. I'm the founding artistic director of Golden Thread Productions. We're a theater company in San Francisco focused on the Middle East. Um, we, have, uh, we were founded in 1996, and from the very beginning, uh, we uh, had free exchange with uh, artists in the Middle East just through personal connections and contacts, uh, guest directors, guest performers, uh, and um, I would say by mid-2000s, uh, uh, it, it became more difficult. So uh, I'll get into that a little bit more. Our um, programs are uh, Reorient Festival of Short Plays, uh, which happens every two years now. And this year in October and November, it will take place. We do a youth outreach program. We um, uh, have collaborations and commissions for new full-length plays as well. Hi, I'm Jojo Roof, uh, she, her, hers. I'm the managing director of Theater J. 
um, which is based in a Jewish community center in Washington, D.C. I'm only four months into that job, so when Julie and I first proposed this, at the time I was the managing director of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics, which is based at Georgetown University. Um, and we do a ton of international work. Um, we uh, bring international work to D.C. and sort of perform it both on Georgetown University's campus and within the D.C. community. Um, and then we also develop work um, and tour it internationally. Um, and uh, I was also part of the founding of the Global Theater Initiative, which is a partnership between the lab um, and TCG, um, and participated in a bunch of different international collaborations and was knee deep in visas for many, many years. So um, that is a lot of what I'll talk about. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ravi Jain. Uh, I have a t I'm the founding artistic director of a theater company called Why Not Theater, based in Toronto, Canada. We're an international theater company. Uh, the work we make uh, celebrates difference and challenges the status quo of what stories are being told and who gets to tell them. We basically do three things. We make and tour uh, our work. We share our resources to support and develop the work of other artists who don't have an infrastructure. And we provoke systemic change uh, through innovative producing models and through the presentation of international work that's often not in English in Toronto. Great. Um, so, you know, especially kind of amongst us, we do have a lot of years of experience in the international arts sector, but we certainly, we're not experts. Uh, I think especially because the world is changing all the time, because governments change, policy change, so we really are interested in a conversation. Um, so we hope you'll, you'll stick around and, and, and spend time with us. Um, but we do want to share some of our experiences, hear from you, and, and talk a little bit about this. And we are going to talk a little bit about the problems, of course, the issues, but we also really want to talk about the joy and importance of this work. It's absolutely doable for those of you that maybe are interested in it but haven't delved into it yet. It, it, it is really an important thing to do, and there's, there's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing to do, and it's really rewarding. So, um, so we're going to try and not be too dismal up here. <laughs> Um, um, but to start, um, I, I'm going to, I'm going to start and then, and then hand it over and we'll go into kind of the nuts and bolts. Cause what I, what I'm just want to kind of plant a little seed amongst this group of people who are interested in this work. One of the really great things about running a, an international theater festival is that I get to spend quality time with artists, really talking to them from all over the world and hearing about their experiences. And one of the things that I have been hearing uh, lately, the, especially the past couple of years, is a, a little bit about um, what I would kind of kind of say like the, the ethics of this work and a little bit about sort of a code of conduct and how, how this work should be done. And, and it's... You know, there isn't, we've talked about, like, there isn't a, a manual, and, and we don't really have that. But, um, so the example I'm going to use really fast is uh, a, a, a teaching artist, a dancer in, in Ghana, um, who, you know, there was a U.S. artist who got a small grant. She went out there, she did a, like, one-day workshop. Then she returned back to the U.S., where she then started teaching, like, master classes in this sort of indigenous dance style, and was charging people, and without sort of having the conversation with her about it, without sort of really, um, you know, talking about how, what is the best way, what's the best practices around things like that. And, um, you know, so I, I just kind of want to plant the seed of like, what, what, what is the collective sort of <laughs> code of ethics around doing international collaboration? How do we not colonize that work? How do we not appropriate it? How do we have the conversations about how to dig in and make shows in other places and collaborate with artists? without, um, you know, in, in a way that is, that there's reciprocity, is that the other room? Of me, okay. Um, and so that's just kind of a, a little, a little seed that I wanted to plant. I don't really have answers necessarily. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about it. And, um, and but I would, I, I, I think it's a conversation that as we dig into this work, we should continue to have what is, um, the best way for us to be doing this kind of work in a way that isn't, um, yeah, that is, is with good, with, I don't know, good behavior. I mean, we all know that as travelers, right? Like, you know, like, we, we try to pay attention to how we travel culturally. Like, you know, is it okay to wear a skirt into this? And, you know, making sure to ask questions and, and things like that. But especially thinking about, especially now, I feel like our mission is very much um, you know, diplomacy through the arts, that we are diplomats, that that is our job, especially now, I feel like especially U.S. artists, that this is a great way that we can continue the diplomacy around the world, and so uh, how can we be good diplomats? So I just want to 
<laughs> drop that seed in. And if you want to have more conversations with me about that. And again, hopefully we, we can create a network. Um, like I said, we're figuring out how to do that where we can continue to have these kinds of conversations as well as the visa questions, the travel ban conversations, the funding questions, things like that. So, okay. So speaking of that, let's talk about everyone's favorite thing, visas. Hooray. Great. Okay, um, so um, when we were first thinking about this, uh, um, so several years ago when sort of the international conversation first started at TCG, there was, um, as sort of Julie likes to talk about, there was like a handful of people in the room, there were like, I don't know, 10 of us, and it was like the same 10 people sort of in every room, and so I feel like we're excited that it's like expanding in, in really important ways, um, and I think a lot of what we heard and what we wanted to do with this session is sort of demystifying the fact that like bringing international artists to the US is is too hard. It's hard, but but it, it's totally feasible and I think Julie and Tricklock are a really great example actually of it doesn't actually take a huge amount of money to do it and and Joanne can certainly talk about this as well. Um, so I was just going to do a really quick sort of visa overview and ha very happy to answer questions. And again, I am 100% not an expert. I am like speaking from my experience of being sort of you know, knee deep in it in a variety of capacities, um, and uh, both sort of in my role at the lab and then continuing at my role at Theater J right now. Um, but just wanted to do sort of a really quick visa overview. So getting really into the nuts and bolts. But um, so sort of the B1, B2 visa is the visitor's visa. You can also come on sort of using business while you're here, but you can't get paid for it. Um, you can get an honorarium, but you cannot get paid as under B1, B2 visas. And then P visas are groups performing and O visas, O1 or O2 visas is for individuals to ex possess extraordinary ability in the field, so in the arts. Um, and there's two sort of major changes that, um, that I've experienced that have really shifted the field. Um, the first one was in the summer of 2018, um, where when people are applying for visas, um, they now, um, when sort of the US consulates are looking at sort of what your past applications have been, they will actively research whether the artist had violated visas in the past, meaning they've come here on a, the wrong visa intentionally or unintentionally. I've had experiences where artists were part of a group and the group, you know, unintentionally applied for the wrong visa for them. Um, but they're using, they're now using any and all available resources, which includes like going into other departments and like researching the IRS and Googling you. And so I think as we think about bringing international artists here, the importance of, re of using the right visa and applying with the right visa is sort of more paramount now than ever. Um, and then the second change um, is in September of 2018 um, is that unless, um, so the you can now apply for, uh, or excuse me, so when you're going through the process and the individual um, doesn't have, uh, for instance, a letter from artists, uh, from Actors' Equity saying that they're allowed to perform here or they're, they're missing a, a form um, or the uh, USCIS thinks that they're missing a form, um, it used to be that they had a chance to basically apply for, to pause the process, submit additional paperwork, and then continue the process. Um, now there is no extension of that period of time. You're just denied and you have to start from the very beginning. Um, so the process is just, it's a lot more sort of laborious and, um, and ultimately ends up taking a lot of time. And, and I've worked with a um, visa attorney, um, uh, Jonathan Goldstein, um, who, or excuse me, Brian Goldstein um, who out of New York, um, who basically recommends that you always apply for as quick of a visa as possible. So you basically pay for extra, the extra money in order to go through the process because you can be denied and have to go back to the beginning of the process again. Um, and I know we're gonna go to the travel ban in a second. Um, what's, what I've also been told is the travel ban is really hard for people to come here as visitors. It's actually just as easy in some ways to apply for P1 or O1 visas, even under the travel ban. But I'm curious, I have not experienced that personally, so I'm curious your opinion on that, Tarange. Um, so, yes, I'm, I can. Sure, yes, happy to answer questions. Um, I think we're gonna have a little bit of a more like deep conversation about this over lunch. Um, and I think the, the bottom line that I've experienced is that it's like the detail oriented uh, nature of it is more important, but it's 
and it's challenging and there's there's a lot of paperwork and it's a, it's a process but that um, at the end of the day there are people who, there are lawyers who are working pro bono there are lawyers who you can pay to help you as well but that the most important thing is to not apply for the wrong visa because it uh, penalizes both the organization and also more importantly the individual um, and they can be denied from coming back to the United States for three to five years if they've applied on the wrong visa um, and so can it really affect them in the future. And sometimes it can affect even just um, just being able to travel, of course. Like if they do the ESTA, the, if they do the tourist visa, because they're like, I'll just come, it's cool. And then and then it is found and done. Then just even trying to come again on an ESTA as a tourist to come and visit, this this ban is really, they, you just can't travel. So you, it really could affect artists that are trying to come just even to, to in the way that they travel. Anyone from anywhere, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say one last thing. I think um, we've all had like variety of experiences of, of artists from all over the world, um, and, um, but I'm currently in the process of applying for um, a, British citizen, a British, British citizen who's a choreographer coming from London, so like in some ways, the, he's, a, he's a white male, so like he, is, he should be like ushered in and pretty easy to come in, and we're flying him to Belfast because it's, it's too hard to get him an interview in London um, and going and still applying for expedited visa processing and still hiring a lawyer for this. And so in some ways, just like the, ch the everyday challenges of it are for everybody. They are certainly um, increased if you are from specific countries or specific regions of the world. Um, but that even that this British choreographer, we are trying to get to the United States for, you know, for our first show of the season, like having to go through sort of additional processes for that. So. It's expanded across the board. Yeah. Absolutely. Steven, yeah. I will speak into the mic. Thank you. You said you could come on a tourist visa for a stipend. Is there a limit to what that stipend is? I actually don't know the answer to that. I don't. I think you can get an honorarium, and I don't think that there's a um, like a maximum amount. But I actually, I, I have not applied for that, so I can't speak to that. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, Sorry. Um, there is a limit to the honorarium. I'm not sure of the amount. It's actually pretty modest. But if you exceed that amount, then they are able to, all of this information is on the IRS page. Um, they would have to then, regardless of where they're from, report it to the American government. Yeah, and I think, that I think that there are two things here. So one is what type of visa you're allowed to apply for and the fee associated with it, which it sounds like there is a limit. I think secondarily to that, taxation on artists that come here. So you do have to pay federal, the artists do have to pay federal tax and sometimes state tax depending on the state. And then the amount is determined by an agreement between their government and the US government. And if there is no ag agreement, then it's their tax 25%. Oh, 30%? Okay. This is one of the reasons oh, yeah. why also having a network, like the more yeah. of us that produce when artists come, being able to come to New Mexico and then to DC and then to California is really great because we can like share the burden. <laughs> yeah, I wanted you guys to start talking about the um, relationship between IRS um, obligations and the whole visa process because now artists, who don't file their taxes, which most artists don't because it's just very burdensome and, you know, have you ever tried to do your own taxes? <laughs> um, so now they're, they're clamping down on that. And so uh, if you don't file your taxes, um, you don't get to come back. And they are cross-referencing. And now the IRS, because it's been um, shrunk uh, in terms of personnel, will only look at um, uh, at taxes for artists who make over 10,000 US dollars a year and many artists who travel here absolutely don't make that. So it just it just keeps becoming more and more challenging to do this work. Hi, 
Hi, I was wondering about the difference between like student visas and if you can get a student visa and still perform in an international theater and how that affects that if you're like studying abroad. So my understanding, I feel like I need to stipulate at the beginning of every answer that I'm not an expert in this. My understanding is you cannot perform as a student and in fact the um, new regulation that was passed, if anybody knows differently, please correct me. Um, but my understanding is that, so the regulation that was passed in September, that if you come in on the wrong visa and they can sort of look through Google, they can look through the IRS in order to determine in the past whether you've come in on, a, on a, the wrong visa, is actually targeting students more than anybody else. And so it's students, I think, largely overstaying their student visa and continuing to work. Um, but I think you need to, there's a way, I think, that you can sort of stack visas, too. Um, but you, you need to be here and be operating under the regulation of the current visa you have. Um, and that, again, but my, just under, my just understanding. Just to clarify, yeah. perform professionally. So if you were studying abroad and you were performing um, at the school you were studying abroad with or um, performing not for pay or, you know, enhancing your performance skills, that would certainly be okay, performing for, for work. Just a, this may be self-evident to some, but one thing I've been struck by is that the legal landscape of this in terms of incredibly well-intentioned people on the front lines of doing this work have uh, very, very different senses of what the right thing to do in certain circumstances are. So just to kind of be aware that, that the landscape is so shifting. And I would just put a... Um, yeah, an unsolicited plug for um, the work of Tommy's Dot, the organization T A M I Z D A T, and Matt Covey's work, which has really put itself out there as an, a kind of a non self interested resource for the field in terms of uh, engaging this. And I think is a real kind of if you're kind of getting this advice from this lawyer, it's a it's a great. Um, additional resource, um, but it's a, that landscape. Just because one lawyer tells you something who may mean well, you might hear something incredibly different the next the next conversation. Yeah, yeah. T A M I Z D A T and Covey Law. They're in Brooklyn and they're great. And when I also when we email, I'm happy to send those links as well. And there's a couple of or they're really I work with them too. They're really great. And but there's a couple of other organizations too. And there's one in London and things like that. We'll try to send those resources as well. I think just the other thing um, is the landscape is also constantly changing. And so like the the lack of funding to the State Department means that there are fewer U.S. representatives in other countries able to take interviews. Um, and, and so they're just like the ripple effects of this and that it really is changing sort of on a day-to-day -day basis and that, um, and that it's incredibly hard for anybody to stay on top of it and that, um, and so like following the regulations that you know to be true, but then like really could change month, month to month. Um. Oh, okay, let's do one more, and then we're going to move on to, to travel. But don't worry, we're going to talk a lot about visas at lunch, too. Yeah, and less about visas and more maybe it's the move on thing. But just to say, yeah, that all sounds complicated and bleak and expensive. And, and it is situational. It's project to project. What country is it emanating from? What degree of mastery do they have? And so what we've done at Arts Emerson is just say, you know what? We're going to do this one at a time, not get overwhelmed by how crazy it is, and just solve it project to project. And uh, in the seven years and probably 30 projects that we've done, we did lose one, and it was only uh, lost on a visa issue. It was lost because of the sequester, not because um, we couldn't solve it other way. So just if you're thinking about doing it, yes, it's a whole thing, but just like art, if you, you get overwhelmed if you try to do all of it, just do the thing you're doing and make your way to the end of that one and then go on to the next one. And again, one of the reasons we're trying to gather us all and create a network is so we can help each other, right? David has so much experience and, you know, Derek in the lab. And so being able to say, okay, I want to do this. This is the first time I've ever done it. Who can help me? We can help you. I mean, a little bit, you know, at least send you in the right direction. Okay. Um, let's talk about our second favorite thing, the travel ban. <laughs> um, I thought maybe I'll start a little bit by um, just clarifying that Golden Thread, we... Um, work with Middle Eastern American artists and we produce locally in San Francisco and we work with Middle, uh, Middle Eastern artists in the Middle East as well as the global diaspora. 
Uh, and over the years, obviously, there are more and more Middle Eastern artists spread across the world. Um, we have, uh, in the past, uh, been able to facilitate long-term collaboration among uh, American artists and Middle Eastern artists to create new work. For example, a project called Benedictus that was between Iranian, Israeli, and American artists that we were able to produce over the course of a three-year development supported by a university and then locally produced in San Francisco. Um, we have been able to do, for example, artistic exchange between Middle Eastern American artists in the US and Middle Eastern artists across the world, teaming them up to create new work together and then presenting that at the Orient Festival. Um, we have uh, been able to benefit from partnership with larger organizations that specialize in international, in presenting international work or working with international artists such as Theater Without Borders. Uh, we have partnered with them to host uh, eight Palestinian playwrights to come to San Francisco to the Orient Festival and we present a showcase stage reading of their plays um, and present their work at the festival. With San Francisco International Art Festival, we've partnered with them to bring productions from Syria, from Germany, of um, Arab, um, a mix of Arab actors, uh, from Egypt, um, and from Iran via Europe um, to present in San Francisco at, international, at the International Festival. So we've certainly had a lot of success, uh, which kind of uh, makes the current situation even more painful. Um, in recent two rounds of San Francisco International Art Festival, we have partnered with them to present work from the Middle East, um, including with Middle Eastern artists who have passports in um, Europe, from European countries where they are now refugees. Um, and we have uh, experienced um, uh, outright uh, rejection. The first round, uh, the artists were uh, rejected outright. This recent year, some artists, their petitions were approved, but then when they went for their interview, their visa was rejected. Um, so this is um, probably the most extreme situation that we have experienced. Um, Golden Thread as an individual organization kind of stopped even um, trying to bring international artists because the work was so extensive and we felt like we we're just banging our head against the wall, but we did have success with the International Art Festival, um, so this is surprising, and I know that it didn't only happen to the Middle Eastern artists. I know that other troops, I don't know exactly from which countries, but I know that two other troops as a group were denied uh, visas. Um, the San Francisco International Art Festival has a process where the visas or the, when the petitions are rejected, they move up the request to uh, a local representative's office. So in our case, Nancy Pelosi's office, Speaker of the House, or Dianne Feinstein, one of the um, longest standing senators. Um, <coughs> uh, so we petition their office and they are happy to um, intervene and support the petition, but in this year even, uh, Nancy Pelosi's intervention did not uh, help our situation. Um, I don't know what questions I can answer because I actually have no answers. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I want to say is that, you know, for many of the artists, the, the you know, it's not as simple when, when they're applying for a visa, it's not as simple as like, you know, taking the bus to your local embassy and, and applying for a visa because, uh, for example, there is no U.S. embassy in Iran. Uh, so Iranian artists, in order to apply for a U.S. visa, they have to go to a foreign country to a U.S. embassy to apply for a visa, and then they go back to Iran waiting for their appointment, and then once they're given an appointment, they have to travel again for that interview. So that's already two foreign trips that they have to take <laughs> just to go through the process. So it's a bit of...
little dog ear that if there's time in our conversation to start addressing a new issue, well, it's not really new, but um, health care and medical care for our artists and vice reciprocal, how is that challenged? I've had a couple of our artists that have had exports, um, especially with extreme theater, I physical theater, anybody who does Cirque type arts, how is that handled and vice versa? And going into volatile countries like Venezuela now where their healthcare systems are collapsing and you know the different relationships that, how are you guys addressing that? And we don't have to talk about it now, but I just want to put that in there as something that we do need to talk about collectively. That's a really great issue. And I if we can't get to it now, maybe we could talk about it a bit at lunch. Does anyone have anything though? Any thoughts on that? Outside of, okay, well maybe we should. Yeah, we'll put a big star by that. That's really important. Any other thoughts on the, or questions for the no answers that we have here? <laughs> here we go. This is an appropriate time. So we, we actually did have a, a group leader <laughs> enter herself on our experience. I can, I'm just gonna give you some nuts and bolts for working with youth in cultural exchange and including the group leaders <laughs> working with the youth. Um, so we and I, if anybody in the room um, is a youth or works with youth and is considering cultural exchange, I really um, can't promote it enough. It has opened our eyes. It has been an incredibly rewarding experience. It just takes a lot of organization and it's a little bit like being a camp counselor on steroids because you have to have all of your ducks in a row times 10, but if you do it, it will be very rewarding. Um, so we, we are new to it. So I, while I am no expert on visas, I can share all of the mistakes we made on the logistics end um, and are continuing to learn. So we traveled with a group um, of teen dancers to a festival in Brixton, Italy last June, so recent. Um, and that was an incredible experience. But here are some things that we learned along the way logistically. Um, and those include having an itinerary very explicitly typed out, printed, and with you. Because as a group leader, you can't be with the student as they go uh, through security and immigration. So that each student needs that in hand with a letter from the festival. Um, having all medical information for each student and a plan from your organization's uh, insurance so that if there is a medical situation, you're covered. Um, and then, additionally, really thinking about how you're preparing, not logistically, but ethically for that international exchange. So our students, m most who had never been outside of the country, also had never heard a performance not in English. So they were not prepared to experience other art forms or art forms not spoken in their language, and that took a few days to settle into. And so now, <laughs> like 2020 lens, I would have prepared more with them about what they were about to see so that they could have had taken away the, the best experience possible. Um, so I'm gonna fast forward a little bit and get to um, some of the exchange between bringing a group here. So our students made an, a very um, incredible connection with a group from Russia. It's called Piano Theater, and that the students uh, from Piano Theater are students who are at a boarding school that's specifically for deaf students. So those students are deaf, um, and they are incredible physical theater performers. So their work is incredibly physical, and their group leaders are incredibly physical. We were lucky enough to receive a TCG Global Connections grant to bring um, four of their students and two leaders over to the US to work with our dance students. So from a budget perspective, that grant was $5,000, and then we also had, were able to pull some funds uh, through other sources. So our students who were participating in that exchange, um, because it was over spring break, we were able to make it tuition-based, and students who couldn't afford, we were able to pull from our scholarships. So our total budget was $7,000 that we were able to do it with. Um, so some things to consider in that process include housing. So when we did the application, we thought we'll do homestays. And our, our friends in Russia said, yes, they would love to do homestays. That will be an incredible experience for them. But the reality was we did an Airbnb. And the reason for that is because the logistics of then trying to arrange each individual student coming day to day was going to be incredibly difficult. And our students and their students also wanted a central place to gather and to be together. So that we quickly re 
rebudgeted and reallocated our funding. Um, the second thing is to have a plan in the states for if somebody gets sick. So none of the students got sick, but a group leader uh, hurt her knee really, really badly. She could not walk. She couldn't walk. And that was, um, but our organization had things in place, including our HR director was very in the know of the, of the group coming and is, was very in touch. We are lucky enough to work down the street from an urgent care. And she was prepared because she also had her, had her health. We were able to work with her health insurance, the woman from Russia and our, and our office and our, our doctor at the urgent care. But having a plan in place ahead of time was incredibly important. Um, some other things that we didn't think about ahead of time, I felt we had a, an obligation. These were students who had never been to the US before. So for them to spend all of their time in our um, lovely dance studio was not gonna be enough. So really planning through what else they were going to do during their time. And some mistakes along the way, I thought, well, we, could wa we should watch a rehearsal at Gallaudet University, which, um, would be an incredibly appropriate experience. However, we took them to see a rehearsal and the rehearsal was a group in partnership with Gallaudet, but was, was mostly using spoken words. So that was a really tough experience. Um, so that was a mistake along the way. Um, trying to think of some other mistakes along the way that might be helpful. Um, I, I would say, um, just really also working, if you can, with any other cultural organizations that might have an appropriate tie. So it was very important to the group that we worked with from Russia to connect with the Russian embassy in the US. Um, and so we had, but some things that were challenging is, our, so our two groups created a performance together. Um, and we wanted to do, invite the um, members of the Russian embassy, but they do not work on the weekends. So we had to like reconfigure everything to make it fit and it had to be before 5 p.m. at the Russian embassy. So just thinking through all of those logistics were incredibly important. Um, and the last thing I'll share is that um, it was, you have to sort of, you're a, you're a host. So you're on call the entire day and the entire night. And that includes like a trip to the grocery store, um, a hurt knee, transportation, but it, it at the end of it, um, our students were cooking together, and it's the last night, and we were very tired. <laughs> the adults were very tired, and my um, one of our students said, "Mr. Man, can this please happen again? When can we do this again?" <laughs> I think I, I think I, I think I said something like, "We'll see." Yeah, in my mind, it was in my mind, it, it was it was never. Um, but we are getting together with that group again in June in Canada, so, and they invited us, and I, and I said, why are you, you know, they were invited to be a part of a, fes a festival and perform at a festival in Canada, and I said, and they have invited us to bring some of our students and to perform with them, and I, sa and I said, I, I so asked why, I mean, in a, in a sort of, you know, why, why us, why, and, and the response I got was because this form of cultural diplomacy is incredibly important and for Russian youth and US youth to work together in this way is something that the world needs to see as a picture of the US and Russian youth. And I, that has stuck with me a lot because I just, I thought, you know, I felt like we gained so much from, from them because I, I learned so much, but to see that, that it was reciprocal and to understand why they wanted to work with us was also important. Um, just in the interest of time, and speaking of Canada, let's hear from Ravi so we can hear a little bit about, uh, you know, producers and, and artists who are working outside of the U.S. And, and what's happening with them and things like that, and then we'll have some time as well as for some continued um, conversation and, and questions. Yeah, thanks. So, um, I'm from Canada. Uh, we're in a really different context to you all. Um, uh, we have a lot of funding right now that's geared toward international everything. It's a big part of the government's plan to open borders and building international relationships. So, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the Raptors won last night, so I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Uh, oh. All right, okay, all right, all right, all right. Um, they're gonna revoke my visa. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's a very different context. There's a lot of support and energy uh, toward uh, international uh, producing both import and export. And I guess the one little thing I can add in terms of presenting internationally, so we've, we, for the last 
eight or so years have been presenting work from abroad that's not in English. And one really exciting thing about that is, you know, Toronto is a multicultural, multilingual city, and English is a real barrier for a lot of people to go to the theater. Um, so we started producing shows from India, from, from Brazil, from Japan. And uh, one of the things we realized was in, in, uh, in terms of the question around ethics was um, a lot of communities in terms of accessing the tickets didn't want to access them online. They didn't want to put a credit card online. They didn't want to do it that way. So we worked a lot with a lot of community organizations to sell tickets through grocers, through finding different unique ways that each individual community wanted to access and, and deliver tickets. It's super complicated. We lost a lot of tickets that like just disappeared. But <laughs> but we did sell out each of the shows. I mean, the, the presence of the community was, was there. And part of that was really the strategies of working with local community groups and ensuring that we were really working on their terms. Um, uh, and then the other thing I, I thought I would add in was just, you know, as an artist, how do you get your work out there? It's such a hard, daunting, scary thing. And again, we, we've had a lot of support and funding to do that. And, you know, uh, Edinburgh is such an important market to try to get to if you can. It's super expensive. But if you're an artist and you're trying to get out there, uh, I don't know what the visas are for, for Edinburgh, but the last time I remember going through for Canada, because we're a commonwealth, it was like you just go to the border and there's a spe special Edinburgh visa where you just go and you say, I'm going to Edinburgh. They're like, okay, great, you go through. So it wasn't an application process. It wasn't a big, big thing, at least for Canadians. So I don't know about Americans. Um, but to go there, uh, you know, these festivals are where everybody goes. And presenters, curators from around the world, they're just normal people. And it's important to just talk to them and say hi and introduce your work and to not be afraid. Like, that's their job. You're helping them. If, you f if they find great work, they want to meet you. And so don't be shy to build relationships. And as, as Julie was saying, just the networks of people also around you, a huge resource that we had was um, there's a very important international festival in Vancouver called the Push Festival, um, which was really um, a huge platform for us. Norman Armour, who was the former, ar former artistic director there, uh, presented one of our shows and was just a champion. He would tell all these people. So like I would go and meet a presenter and they say, oh, I know about you because Norman told me about your show. <laughs> and just this, the communities are actually quite small. And the more people you can meet, the more people who can advocate for you and get the word out there, the better it is. Um, uh, what else did I want to say? Yeah, so it's all about relationships and partnerships. And, um, you know, it is a funny thing. The line across Canada and America is, is tricky. Like, uh, it's a new – we presented a couple shows in the States, but the, the, the it's not often we, – we're seeing less and less work coming to Canada from the States. And to the, the word kind of uh, unanimously around the communities, it's hard to get into the States without an American agent. So the dynamics of those things are all – kind of new terrain for me as well. And I don't know if that's because of the visas. I don't know if that's because of the money. But it is strange because we are neighbors and and the work uh, is in real dialogue with each other. And so how to foster more of those uh, collaborations is something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, and another area that is great to get to if you can is New York in January has everyone in the world in America. They descend upon Ameri uh, on New York. Again, these things are really expensive. Like I don't want to, I want it for at least from my perspective, and, uh, but it, it uh, not but, and I would see it as a way of thinking about it as an investment in your work that it, you're going to go and ideally meet some people, build relationships and, and try to get your work out there. Um, and really it's about just, yeah, making those relationships. And really quickly, one, um, one thing that we just, we talked about yesterday, but, um, for many years, the, um, the Embassy of Canada in DC would send a DC artistic director to Canada to sort of scout for work and, and with the aim of bringing work back into DC and that happened for years and years and years. And then, I don't know, six years ago, seven years ago, it stopped and it just started for the first time this year. So my artistic director is going up there this summer for a bunch of different trips to scout Canadian work. So I also, I don't know why this, this changed, maybe because of the increase in funding from the Canada side, but it does feel like it's potentially a moment and like that feels really exciting that um, sort of the, the border can be more permeable than it has been in the past. And again, as we, as we do create a network, thinking about strength and numbers and thinking uh, looking at the modeling of how Canada is doing it, I, I do, I'm really curious about how we can impact policy change. I mean, one of the frustrating things about visas is that our US government does not understand what artists do. 
They don't understand what you know international collaboration is. That's part of the problem. So so how do we also how do we make that known? How do we change that? How do we how do we fix that? How do we uh, you know how do we try to to put these policies into place? I don't know the answers to that, but I'm I'm curious about trying to make real systematic you know impact in, in that. So. Do you think the U.S. government not understanding what artists do has been true for a long time under the Obama administration and, okay, and it's just gotten worse with the current administration? Well, I think, I, I think what's gotten worse is just, well, <laughs> a lot of things. Um, um, I, I, I mean, it's just, 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 just crossing borders in general, I think it's just gotten worse. But I think, I think in general, unfortunately, there's, you know, I mean, I could go into a long conversation about it, but, you know, they understand, like, cats, like we were saying yesterday, like, they're like, that's theater. I understand that. Like, you're going to bring a giant, th the Lion King comes, that's theater. But I don't think they understand, like, why would you bring the, like, Venezuelan clown, uh, political clown? Like, they're like, that's not, I don't understand what that is. So I think that is, is, is what the problem is. They don't understand the breadth of what theater is. Like, outside of the U.S., what theater is is so many things. <laughs> But in the U.S., I think there's an, uh, an understanding of one thing, not with everybody, but with some people, and I think unfortunately with our government. So they're like, I, so tr it's like the, the, this categori these categories of what visas are, you know, I mean, I do a cultural festival, so sometimes people are coming and, and they're getting small honorariums, but they're actually doing a like immersive workshop is the work, that's the theater. They're, you know, so, and, and so they don't understand. They're like, I don't understand what visa to apply for. And, and, and it gets denied a lot because it's like, oh, you're from a, you know, a challenging country and I don't understand what you're doing. So you just can't come. Yeah. I just wanted to add cool. that in the 70s, at least, there used to be uh, American cultural institutes in various countries. For example, in Iran, there was one. In Lebanon, there was one. And then through uh, American University in Beirut or American University in Cairo, would actively facilitate artistic exchange and present American artists' work in those cities, uh, and that has stopped. Mm. Did you have a question or a comment? I guess I don't have to talk. <laughs> I was just gonna ask, like as a young person, I definitely have a lot of thoughts on how systemic it is, but then you guys jumped right into that conversation. But then just like adding in, just do these opera houses and like the Lion King, are they able to do that because they're able to pay for it because the like governments value them more or also because they just have enough people and resources in order to get the same visas for their artists? So just thank you. That would be my, anybody here produce the Lion well, King uh, in the big opera house? <laughs> I don't know, I don't, that's not what I do. So, I mean, I, that's my assumption. I don't, I don't oh, know about, I don't know what Ameri like outside of world class like Yo Yo Ma touring internationally. I don't know what other American artists are currently inter uh, traveling internationally or touring. Um, but you know, many countries have um, Ministry of Art and Culture. Many countries have cultural attaches that really facilitate these kinds of artistic exchange and. To my knowledge, we don't have such an institution in the U.S. Um, and whenever I bring up this <laughs> subject, people are like, you know, no, 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 I don't know. But you know, it's it's something that we lack as a country. Yeah. And on that, we are a company. Broadway producing companies like Broadway Asia, which is Mark Routh and Simone Genet. They Broadway Asia, in Asia, they love Ethel Merman, for example. But if it were Lion King doesn't happen to be their show, but the producers is there. Nothing, theirs. Against, Lion Nothing against Lion King, but whatever product is there, they have a reciprocal. So it's almost like a bicultural, an office that's based in Asia and on Broadway. So they've circumvented all of this um, and still do it that way. And other, the other product, um, it's international producers that have bought the royalties and rights and do the American shows, but in their version and translation. So there's the equivalent of the Mark Routh or Disney producer in Mexico, and that's how they do it. And does that answer your question or? Yeah. <laughs> I'm to just hop on that. That is very true and it depends on the show itself too. So 
For example, Kinky Boots has been in the United States, it's been in the UK, uh, it's been in Germany, but it's actually just entered the Asian market recently and you're looking at um, into China and then also in Japan. At the end of the day, it does come down to money. So um, to hop on what you said too, it, uh, those contexts, is, it's gonna be Broadway commercial theater and they're looking at it at that avenue too and it takes a while. Um, to break down certain barriers for that. They're not looking at the context of theater to be very much different than Midtown in Manhattan. It's very different. And then the communications um, with Disney, I mean, you're looking at a global enterprise. And again, it comes with finances for money. So I don't know if that answers your question completely. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just so layered and seared in so many different like elements within it. I'm gonna, Julie, I'm gonna jump in while you Yeah, you got back. it. Uh, part of me wonders though, David, to your point earlier is, so I've been told by a couple different um, lawyers to make your artist look as close to the Royal Shakespeare Company as possible because that's a known quantity for sort of the reasons that you all are saying. A and while I think that's valuable because each individual visa application feels vital, it feels urgent, it feels important, it feels like you know you don't want your show to not happen, I also feel like we as artists maybe have a responsibility to show the artist as they are because otherwise we're, oh, we're constantly referring to them as, you know, we're constantly trying to compare them to the Royal Shakespeare Company and we're not actually expanding what people's experience are. And so, and there are examples of, you know, of at the lab or at Arts Emerson or at, you know, festivals at Trick Lock at all over the country that have been able to get artists in who don't look like the Royal Shakespeare Company and look like the opposite of the Royal Shakespeare Company. And so, I don't know, it feels like this weird rock in a hard place where you really want to get your artist in and so you want to do everything you can to, to um, portray them in, in the light in which the members of the you know, US consul in whatever country you're in can view them that way. And also we're not expanding, we're like trying to cater to them a little too much. Yeah, we have a question over here and then I'll come over to Can David and Olga. Can I just add that, is it the consulate's job to assess the artist artistically? Like, is that what they're assessing? Or is it really like, they have a host, there's a program, they're gonna be performing, they're gonna come back. Like, that, those are the nuts and bolts. Why, do, why should we have, like, why should we have to prove to them that this artist is worthy, mm -hmm. you know? We're inviting them, mm -hmm. give them a visa. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, along the same lines, you know, actually I'm a, I am an international artist and a teacher and I've been on uh, the, the O-1 visas for many years. I had to renew them every year and I have to tell you first that indeed it got much worse for students, for international students and international faculty in these recent years because they used to give us a list uh, visa for a whole year and now they are really giving the visa strictly for the academic here, so you have to go back to your country uh, at the end of May or June, or so things got really, really worse and you have to continuously prove yourself. So for us, I want to restate that it's so hard for us, international artists and faculty, to work in this country. You, it's exhausting. Now my new line is, I'm not exotic, I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to prove myself every freaking year to show that I'm doing things, to, sh to give evidence, and now they just requested new evidence. So that's why I'm on an extended period because they requested new evidence that I'm an alien with extraordinary skills in the arts. So it's again and again. So on that note, my question is indeed, like Torange was saying, so what are the US institutions like TCG, like other um, national umbrellas for the arts doing for us to make things a little easier beyond helping with the, the visas? What can we do on a larger level, on a political level on establishing policies to make it a little easier for us international artists and students and faculty to work in this country. Yeah, we need our own conference, eh? Um, sorry, we'll go, hold on, and then I'll come back over there. I just, I mean, piggybacking on that, one of the things that we haven't talked about is the fact that philanthropy has completely shut down in terms of international cultural exchange. Um, it used to be, you know, 10, 15 years ago that, you know, you could get money from Rockefeller, you could get money from Ford, or, you know, increasingly from Doris Duke, 
And now it's like, you know, I just heard that um, Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation is cutting its um, Southern Exposure Grants program, which was one of the few places that you could get artists from the Caribbean or Latin America support to come to the United States. And so um, I just think that we, as a, as a sector, really need to start thinking about ways to engage the philanthropic community, both private and public, I if we're ever going to be able to tackle this ab above and beyond what the um, lady, the exhausted one, just said. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, we, we do need to um, put feet to the fire in terms of we're becoming more and more xenophobic country. I was just uh, with some of your Canadian colleagues at ISPA, the International Society of Performing Arts, last week in Guadalajara, and what was, you know, so evident is that there are proactive policies going on in your country, uh, and the Mexican government had paid for 75 artists to come from throughout Mexico to participate in ISPA. The, the U.S. delegation, zero. It was just you got there on your own steam, paying your own money. There was no organization in terms of a governmental push. So um, I just think that we really need to factor that in when we're talking about solutions. Yeah, I, um, all of these things. Um, I, I guess partially um, I'm by training and experience a dramaturg, and so I'm looking at the narrative structure of the problem. And uh, in the large part, we have not told the story well about why it matters. And it's so clear. I mean, everybody sitting in this room understands what we are in the world and how we are in the world, especially right now. It was maybe a little less clear when we thought Obama was taking care of everything. But now we know uh, very directly that our, our imprint on the planet is entirely negative. And until and unless we enter the world, um, and we enter it through many different doors, but the arts are one that are directly a narrative art. The funders don't have a story to tell, so they don't know how to make a case for their trustees as to why they would invest in international exchange. Artists don't particularly, we get stuck in the logistics, but we don't actually talk about the, the why um, and our role, we d and we get trapped in the old cultural diplomacy stories when back when there used to be in the 70s, it was sort of this ex exportation of American values. Um, American exceptionalism is still the story in the world and it's killing the planet. And so until we as an arts community actually spend time, and I'm hoping in this database, I'm signing up for let's figure out the story and let's start giving that story to the press, to the funders, to the diplomats, to the politicians, and actually make that case. It's our job to get the story down, and we don't have it yet. And so I'm signing up for that. I can share, as mm -hmm. you're going over, I can share uh, in Canada, um, this lady mentioned, um, uh, there's a, an organization called Capacoa, which is uh, an organization of Canadian art presenters from across the country. And they all, they've all gotten together and have just joined as sort of an ambassador where they're linking up with all these folks who present in any kind of capacity. And we are an advocacy group to uh, promote uh, Canadian culture so and, and, and international touring and presenting. And so one of the things that they've gotten involved in is these trade missions because governments send trade delegations for business to China, to Latin America, to these different countries. And so how do we get arts and culture to be central to that conversation? Because we also, like the Lion Kings or the small companies, we are an economic uh, driver of cul in culture, in the culture sector. Mm -hmm. So actually gathering folks like yourself and, and the big kind of producers to get together and be a, um, an advocacy group that's talking to government in some kind of way might be a great, a great starting point. I also want to add that, you know, there's value in American artists going abroad, but there's also value in non-American artists, foreign artists coming to the U.S. And make no mistake about it, closing our borders serves a political purpose. Keeping this country isolated and insular, culturally separated, ha you know, preventing us from having exposure to artists from other countries. All these countries that are now being vilified, Iran, Syria, Iraq, all of those wars that are being justified, those policies are being justified by preventing you from actually meeting 
human beings, artists, creatives, <laughs> imaginants from those countries. That's what those policies support. Um, I just want to lift exactly what you just said. Um, I was going to talk about how uh, the riff off of you and answer some of your question. Um, so it can go as far back as the Reagan administration when artists become um, the, the face of the Red Scare, the big enemy. Artists are dirty, nasty creatures, and you um, have, uh, um, that's when we constructed boards and um, artists couldn't, um, nonprofits became a big thing and artists couldn't um, control the institutions and th that they, uh, the craft that they practice. Um, and um, something that I'm, I was just, we were working on a grant. Um, I, we were told um, by the cultural ambassador who's in this country um, to not use the word practice in the grant um, because it would advocate that uh, we were sharing some skill with someone else and that, that sent a red flag of uh, don't approve this application because they're sharing something secret. Um, and it like hit me huge as, as we're still there. That's, that's where we are in the work. Um, and I started looking back and realizing um, you brought up um, the need of a cultural institution here um, in America. And I, I think our first step is actually a national theater. Um, we need um, a place where America can say this is the epicenter of what um, um, arts and what culture is instead of the face of Broadway right now, which is the, 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 the what supposedly culture and art is in America. That's why it's so easy for those properties and those people working on those properties to move them around um, globally. Um, yeah, thank you. S super fast. It, uh, the combo of David and Tarange and the com com conversation about narrative and exchange kind of took, uh, got to this, but I would just say the power of not underestimating what it means to, as an individual, given the moment that we're in, be somewhere where you're changing the narrative. And, you know, just in never would have imagined a decade ago that I'm in Bangladesh as the fir as the f as an American who like is radically counter to what is expected in terms of what I'm offering to bring there the, the work you know just was in Moscow where I'm introduced frequently as an American without horns literally with the reminder that like some of us e and then are leading works so like that is the foundation of the and you're all doing this work but of the kind of possibility in exchanges that just that like making that trip or inviting that person is part feeding the narrative and is like importantly political in this moment but David's right then we need to do s we need to <laughs> aggregate those experiences hi everyone I am Sarah Carranza and I work with the Chicago Latino Theater Alliance and we do an annual international Latin American festival in Chicago so we've dealt with visas we've had heartbreaks with Cuba um, but my question is actually piggybacking off of what you had to say one of our biggest missions is about getting our Latinx Chicago theaters to the place that they should be and haven't been for 30-something years. How do we prove that they are part of the American narrative on the international sphere? And how do we get the funding that even the theater community has created about this trickle-down economics that isn't making it to the theaters of color that are run by people of color, produced by people of color, and completely performed by people of color? One thing I've been hearing recently from um, other people around, when you're working with ambassadors, working with cultural attaches in other countries, is a lot of those diplomats are really upset with the current environment. And so they are putting the funds that they have into making sure American artists can travel to their countries and also bringing some of their the artists from those countries into the United States. So. I've, I've started a project of trying to find which ambassadors and which areas that are doing that. Um, the Balkans have become free of doing that quite a bit, but to be a good resource for us to be able to assemble some of those that are e making it easier to uh, make these exchanges happen. That's great. 
Uh, let's do one more, and then, so I'll, do you want to duke it out? <laughs> um, I just had a question, um, as a young person as well. What are we doing as a nation and as um, collaborators and artists, what are we doing to really prove to the administration that international arts matter and that bringing people into the United States is so important to fully round ourselves as people? Like, what are we doing right now? Are th what are organizations that I can, as a student, be a part of to really <laughs> like grind down the fact that this matters and that it's really important? Yeah. Um, so we we have like two minutes left in this session. Can I just throw yeah, back yeah. at you? What are you doing? It's we've been at it for I don't know. <laughs> let's not discuss how many years, but <laughs> you know, it's it's like it's taking I don't know. I mean, it's take every decade there are new challenges, new you know, and things. I don't I don't even know if things are getting better. I mean, things are getting worse. So it's kind of yeah. I don't know. So, w if you let, have ideas, yeah, let's do that. I know everyone's like, ah, m me too. Um, let's do this though. So, you know, technically we have a lunch session at half past t noon, one noon. Um, so, and it's, it's twelve fifteen right now. So, why don't we just take a little breath? If you'd like to come back and continue the conversation, we would love to. And let's try to talk about some solutions, maybe. And we'll talk more about visas and and things like that, of course. Yeah, and just really quickly to name, we are not we are not live streaming the next session, so it will be. I would say less microphone focused and more like a conversation more com yeah. while eating food. Yeah. Thank you everyone so, so very much. <laughs> <laughs>